We entered the land of Ukraine. It was still dry from the melting of the snows, and we had to climb over the sticky mud with great difficulty. But the weather was fine, and we walked, stripped to the waist. On the way we received new orders. Now we were not to go to Vinitsa, but to restore the communication between the rear and the front, broken by the partisans. Their detachments were ordered to be destroyed. Indeed, partisan attacks paralysed the already difficult supply of food and ammunition. The assembly point at Vinitsa was to be retained as a starting point for new offensives of the German army in order to eliminate the wedge by which the Russians had cut into Poland before Lvov and to re-establish communication with the north, which was still standing. Our companies, together with other units, began to fight the partisans in the rear. Otherwise, we were a mobile unit. It was assumed that we would immediately come to the aid where the threat was particularly great. However, our mobility depended on the vehicles, and I have already told you about them. Gradually we abandoned them and moved on horseback or on bicycles, the tyres of which had to be filled with grass. We took horses and bicycles from thousands of refugees, Ukrainians, Roma, Polish settlers. Sometimes there were partisans among them, pretending to be peasants. But at some moments they would shoot German soldiers in the back, causing confusion. It was assumed that we would lose self-control and retaliate against the refugees, and those in turn would defect to our enemies. From the enemy's point of view, the end justified the means. By the end of May we had trapped a large partisan unit of 400 well-armed fighters in the forests. Even predatory animals are afraid of armed men, but those who fled from us could not even imagine that they had spawned an enemy whose courage equalled that which they showed. Our nerves were at breaking point. Despite the fact that many again seized apathy, it became clear who is a coward and who bravely saves his life. For us it was no longer a baptism of fire, but a common thing, though dangerous. Medals for heroism were awarded, as a rule, posthumously. We already drank our cup of horror and saw enough of the glassy eyes of those who received medals. And everyone knew about this side of life. We became fatalists and only laughed out loud. Those who were stronger convinced themselves. We are all destined to die, so does it matter when? Those who were not so strong strove to delay the last minute before death and looked at the world with widened eyes, black as rifle barrels. The rest, that is, most of them, were covered in sweat from fear. It dripped down their synthetic shirts, ran down their legs and down their wounded arms. They were afraid. Their fear nullified any argument. Time seemed to stop for them. That fear went away as soon as we came face to face with the enemy. The first shots raised the curtain. The drama began, consuming all the senses. The first ones fall, and the tension falls with them. Everything loses its meaning. You can only hear the branches crunching underfoot. Our commander, Fieldfebel Spalowski, points out the signs by which we can determine that a large detachment has passed here. Numerous traces of extinguished fires indicate that we are approaching a large partisan camp. How not to run into mines? We have to watch every step and look around properly. The low bushes could well conceal explosive wires. Every metre had to be passed with caution. Low, at the level of the treetops, an airplane passed by. We froze with fear. Suddenly the bombing would start. Finally a short whistle sounded and we fell down on our backs. At the end of the path stood a structure made of logs, a real fortress. A fight ensued. Spalowski ordered Ballers and Prince to throw grenades at the fortress. Prince was one of Lenzen's anti-aircraft soldiers. But there was no need for him today, so Prince carried the explosives. Ballers, in general, resembled a dead man. He was climbing on the other side of the road. We watched them in silence. Who were Baylors and Prince? Two soldiers who came from nowhere. Are they good or bad? Are they full of hate? Does God love them, or is he on the side of their enemies? They are just two people. They, as crazy as we are, have become our friends. Under normal circumstances, not in war, we would hardly want to be friends with them. 
but here their every move had a lot to do with it. Our hearts beat harder. Two unknown soldiers, one of us, became more important to each of us than our closest relatives. It was as if we had become them. Turn it any other way, and they would have been watching over one of us, no matter what we wished for them, as long as they stayed alive. They've gone quite a distance now. Maybe they're getting closer to death. It's just the leaves hiding it from us. I could still see them. Suddenly the prince straightened up and threw his burden at the fortress, then threw himself to the ground. The explosion shook the whole forest. There was a long echo. Birds flew up and flapped their wings in fright. The prince didn't make it. There was a crater, on top of which lay seven or eight metres of planks of guerrilla shelter. Shit, said the field feeble through his teeth. There's no one there, said someone. Now I saw Ballas. He ran, then threw the explosives to and froze. A flash went off among the trees. It was as if the forest groaned with shock. No birds flew now. Ballas stood up, as did the prince, who was a little farther away. Their figures stood out against the broken ground. Behind them there was nothing. The gorilla's fortress had vanished from the face of the earth. This way, friends, shouted Ballas, rejoicing at the feat accomplished. There is no one here. We ran to him. Ballas laughed nervously. From the bushes came a whistling sound, then another and another. The prince ran toward us, and Ballas threw himself to the ground. The gorillas fought like lions in the ring we were gradually tightening around them. Three companies, that is, five hundred or six hundred soldiers, were fighting an experienced enemy. The partisans had so skillfully organised their position that to approach it was tantamount to death. Two of our men ran into mines. Their bodies flew up to the branches of trees on which leaves were already blossoming. We were bombarded relentlessly by four-barrel machine guns. We tried to dig trenches, but there were only roots in the ground, and instead of an attacking position, we got a defensive one, which could not withstand the enemy's breakthrough. Only anti-aircraft guns, which fired almost vertically, could reach the enemy position. Unfortunately, the partisans withstood our shelling. They had two or three howitzers, probably captured from the Germans. The shells were ripping out trees from the roots. It was difficult to determine where they were firing from, and therefore it was impossible to destroy the guns. Ten times we started the attack, and each time we returned to our positions, leaving the wounded behind. Later we learned that Vesredau did everything to send motorised and armoured units to help us. But there were none close by, so we had to make do with our own forces. To help the front was sent everything without reserve. An hour of waiting and intensified attacks passed. Our commander decided to take a risk. Leaving a dozen soldiers around the fortified partisan camp, he concentrated the rest against the enemy's weakest point, a wedge-shaped trench held by forty partisans armoured with reflees and a machini goon. At his order, five hundred soldiers rushed at the enemy, using grenade launchers. Such a blow made the enemy tremble. Seven or eight soldiers were killed in the offensive, but the excellent manoeuvre succeeded, and we did not regret the losses. I marched in the second line, followed by two more platoons. When we reached the enemy position, the partisans were finished. About forty of them still tried to resist, but a shower of grenades had destroyed up to a third of them. The rest were killed by the bayonets of those who first reached the camp. We were on their heels. Another platoon was moving on the right. There were groans in the grass and bushes. It smelled of gunpowder, cinders and blood. I saw the partisans jump out of the dugout and blindly shoot at ours, who had lost their senses from joy. Panic broke out. I, like all the others, began to shoot. A tall Russian shot at me three times but did not hit me. Then he rushed to me, shouting something and waving his rifle, pointing the handle in the air. Two of our men came toward me and shot the Russian. He fell down, trying to reload his rifle, but we rushed to him and clubbed him with our rifle butts. Under the blows, he died. And at the dugout, a hand-to-hand -hand fight ensued. In the midst of the battle, a mine or a grenade exploded, and both Germans and partisans flew into the air. But the fight continued. We heard shouts, groans, shots. In a minute, we found ourselves in the centre of the battle. 
One of those who fought next to me was torn off his arm by an exploded mine. Partisans and Germans, pressed against the log wall, fought with knives, picks, stones. An ober Efreutnant hit a Russian in the face with a pickaxe. Kellermann fired at the partisans, sheltering behind the two howitzers from which we had suffered so much. Many Russians, probably at least half of those who fought, managed to escape. Those who did not get away joined the dead. We picked up weapons and food, destroyed the howitzers, we could not carry them with us, and buried seventy of our soldiers. Then we left, carrying the wounded on stretchers made of branches. In the evening we reached the camp and drank all the alcohol we could get, trying to drown the memory of the bloody day with vodka. It's spring in Ukraine. It gets dark at eleven, but in a few hours it dawns. The weather is perfect, a warm breeze blows, which precedes the stifling summer heat. But though the weather awakened in us thoughts of peace, war, which had only temporarily been paralysed by winter and the melting of the snows, loomed again on the horizon. The Russians dominated the pale blue sky. The power of their air force was immense. The Luftwaffe was limited only by the need to defend German cities and meet the growing needs of the Western Front. Our pilot sorties became tantamount to suicide. The enemy's advantage was too great. The few victories that we managed to win were the result of incredible heroism. The enemy dominated both in the sky and on the ground. In the rear fought equal, the German army and the partisans. We were constantly sending small detachments. Every sortie ended in a clash. On every hill, in every house, there was either a mine or an ambush. We ran out of transportation, fuel, spare parts. There were no new supplies. Despite the air raids, the transports were getting through. But not to us, but to the front. And even there, having arrived at the front line, they could only miraculously reach the units for which the provisions were intended. Most of their supplies were consumed by hordes of starving soldiers retreating in front of the firing rampart. We got only a tenth of what we needed, and even then at great risk. As before, we fed at the expense of the locals, but they had nothing without us. Our appearance did not excite anyone. The problem of food supply came to a head. Since spring had just begun, vegetables and fruits were not yet ripe, and hunting was more dangerous for us than for game. The remnants of our three companies took refuge in a hamlet. Between battles we slept almost naked on the ground. He who sleeps does not feel hunger. It was important for us that this proverb became a reality. With the approach of airplanes, everyone threw themselves into hiding, and when the aircraft hid, we again exposed our bony bodies to the sun. In a half slumber, we looked up at the sky and thought of nothing. And really, why? We had made a complete break with the past. Memories of peaceful life were to us the same as the books we had once read. In the war, we learned to appreciate the small pleasures of life. Today, the sun took away our goulash, sausage and millet. There was no mail either. We lay on Ukrainian soil calm and peaceful. Maybe tomorrow would bring groceries. Or maybe gasoline and spare parts. Maybe even mail would come. A letter from Paula. Or maybe it's just us, the earth, the sky and the sun. It's no use thinking about it. One day, an SOS signal went off in the transmitter. A post on the Romanian border was reporting that it was surrounded by partisans. According to the Wehrmacht, we, as already mentioned, remained part of the motorised units, which at any minute had to come to the rescue, and therefore must constantly move and be ready to quickly arrive at points located within a radius of up to 200 kilometres. The post that gave the distress signal was located at a distance of 160 kilometres, and we were called only because the officers were told that they could rely on us in case of need. In fact, we had only four trucks that could barely move, a civilian van, a motorcycle and an all-terrain vehicle. Vezridao was tearing his hair out in anger. Without wasting time, we rushed to those who needed help. We brought as many assault rifles as we could. In each truck were two Spandau, ready for battle. Most of all, we were afraid of airplanes. With maximum speed, our detachment travelled along the disgusting Russian roads, raising splashes of mud. After driving about 50 kilometres, 
we came across a dilapidated village. The inhabitants rushed with all their legs to escape. We really had a beastly look. At the exit from the village, the first truck hit a dog, and the second truck hit a pig that had jumped out of nowhere. I was in the third truck and was able to enjoy the scene to the fullest. Five or six infantrymen jumped off the truck. To end the pig's suffering, they bayoneted it. Streams of blood drenched the executioners. They tied the pig's legs and hung its 80-kilogram carcass from the back of the truck. We set off again. We had to catch up with the others. Soon the pig was covered with mud. Dust mixed with blood. But we didn't care. The survivors would have pork for dinner. Sieg Heil. We found ourselves in strange terrain. There were black hills with liquid vegetation all around. The ground seemed black and hard as stone. We drove for about 30 kilometres through this landscape. Just as we were leaving the area, the signal, air, came. Our soldiers spotted the planes through the treetops, to the left. The trucks stopped on the side of the road. Here they were covered by trees. Vesredau looked at the sky with binoculars, but saw nothing. We have to wait a little longer. The infantryman from the third truck, not to waste time, cut open the pig carcass and got rid of the guts. We started the engines again. A few kilometres later, the planes did appear above us. There were no trees nearby. They descended and flew directly overhead. We were panic-stricken. But, looking closely, everyone saw that it was a Messerschmitt 109F, but nobody thought of shouting hurrah to the Luftwaffe. We were too frightened. By four o'clock we reached the combat area. Fearing a siege, we barely crawled. Vesredau's all-terrain vehicle was leading the squad. Two scouts did not take their eyes off the dusty road and the mountains surrounding us. Suddenly a valet opened before use. We stopped, turned off the engines and immediately heard the crackly of machine guns. There was no doubt, we were there. We could see a village in the distance. In a premonition of danger, my heart pounded in my chest again. Of course, the enemy knew of our approach. The driver of the first truck noticed how the commander's all-terrain vehicle at a dizzying speed flew out from behind the bend, but he barely had time to overcome the open space as a shell exploded on the road ahead. Everyone rushed to the ground, and the trucks went to the first shelter they could find. The second burst created a hole in the road. A cloud of dust rose. We were shelled with 37mm shells. Then on the first truck was given a machine gun line. But everyone, fortunately, had already gotten out from under fire. The terrain did not allow to distinguish the enemy. Those who rode on the all-terrain vehicle were just lucky. Only miraculously, hidden behind the trees. 37mm machine gun guerrillas did not open fire as soon as he noticed the rover. The road was blocked by a tree trunk. We set up two anti-aircraft guns and began firing at the enemy machine gun. Soon it fell silent. We set up a dozen machine guns. As a result, the fire of the guerrillas firing from the hillside was suppressed. The soldiers, who had crept through the bushes, began to climb the hill. The mortar fire did not stop. We could not hit the enemy and acted only as a deterrent. We were firing at all possible centres of resistance. Finally, we found the partisans. Those bastards, whispered the prince to Smellens. They're just shooting for the fun of it. Well, we'll show them. Our company fired rocket-propelled grenades at the guerrillas. In the area between the hills, the grenades exploded with a terrible rumble. Then the enemy position poured machine gun fire. We recognised it by its sound. Two more grenade throws were enough to force the guerrillas to flee. One of them was killed by a shot. That bastard, shouted the prince, it's sickening to shoot such assholes. You should have stayed home and waited for the war to end. If it were me, I wouldn't lift a finger. You too, sir, right? Home. Yeah, sitting at home waiting for the war to be over. I nodded. Now we'll have to shoot them, said the prince. That's disgusting. Shouts came from the enemy's position. On the left, the silence of the spring day was interrupted by the rattle of machine guns and rocket-propelled grenades.
Suddenly, one of the Russians raised himself up to his waist and opened fire with a machine gun. He fired at random, but one of ours was wounded in the arm, and the second was hit in the calf by a ricocheted bullet. The machine gun killed the Russian. Two partisans jumped out of the trench. The machine gun put them on the ground. Did you see that? Smellens asked the machine gunner. You hit a girl. A girl? You ain't lying, if they've got chicks going into battle. After a few minutes, we counted the dead guerrillas. Six men about our age, among them two beautiful girls covered with blood. The sight of them made us feel bad. They must have gotten in our way. We moved towards the village. The trucks followed us slowly. Perhaps the enemy had gotten the wrong information. Maybe the Russians overestimated our numbers, or maybe they were afraid. It is unclear why they left an almost one position. The sun threw bright rays on the narrow, dusty road. At the beginning of the column, a skirmish broke out between our soldiers and the partisans who were huddled in the village cemetery. The cemetery was typically Russian, blue, gold, white colours everywhere. Grenade launchers and light anti-aircraft guns tore up the cemetery. Two detachments knocked out the partisans and occupied the area. The partisans took refuge in a hut where grain was stored. On the door, the enemy scrawled the slogan, The enemy will be defeated, victory will be ours. To finish off the last stronghold of resistance quickly, we loaded the machine gun with bursting incendiary bullets. After the first shot, the roof went up in flames. The partisans had only machine guns, but they did not waste bullets. From the shot of the anti-aircraft guns, the roof fell down. The guerrillas rushed to escape. Our two squads ran to the building to keep the Russians from leaving. By the ruins half lay a bearded old man. He put his hand on the shoulder of his shot comrade and shouted curses. He was not frightened by our rifles, but continued to threaten us with his fist. It didn't occur to anyone to shoot him. We moved 300 metres away. The old man was buried under the rubble. There were flashes in the sky. The first ranks of our squad were already marching through the streets of the village and shooting at anything that moved. The remnants of the guerrillas rushed towards the hills. At this point they were without cover, and we managed to shoot at least 20 fighters. Especially many partisans were put down by the machine gun. At last the firing stopped. The men from the besieged German post came out to us. Many were wounded, 12 soldiers were killed. We gave first aid to the wounded and drove the inhabitants out of the huts. Fires were burning everywhere. The villagers began to put them out. It took an hour. Then all of them, including us, gathered the dead in one place. Seeing their husbands, sons, lovers, the women screamed and cried. It seemed that most of the partisans lived in this village. Soon the sobs were replaced by curses. We silently gathered our dead and wounded, it was such a beautiful day. It was hard to believe that all this was really happening. Gals, who was dragging the wounded man, looked at the mountain landscape. The birds were still singing and flying merrily in the blue sky. We resembled winter-starved animals who are happy to enjoy the spring sunshine and the fact that we don't have to look for lodging. We perceived what had happened as an unfortunate misunderstanding, which only temporarily interrupted the peaceful joy of nature. The inhabitants were still weeping with despair, and their profanity, the meaning of which we could not understand, annoyed us. A stone thrown by someone struck one of our wounded men in the face. Two infantrymen jumped up, shaking their rifles. Stop it, you pigs, or we'll put holes in you. But the swearing did not stop. It was especially striking to see the women's faces contorted with hatred as they shook their fists. Suddenly, six Soviet airplanes appeared in the sky. The Russians cheered up and shouted, Hurrah! Stalin! They pointed at the airplanes. Hate was written on their faces. We also remembered our own dead, the tragic deaths of soldiers who stood along the line of retreat in winter, the faces of maimed soldiers lying under the dark winter sky. My mouth was dry. We watched the growing anger of the peasants who had paid too great a price for a battle that could have been avoided. If the order to fire had come, we would have obeyed without hesitation. 
I saw two of the men's automatic rifles shaking in their hands and their faces contorted with anger. But then the tall, slender figure of Vesredu appeared, white with anger. He stopped five metres from the Russians and looked at them so that they immediately quieted down. During the long campaigns in Russia, Vesredau had learned Russian. He ordered the villagers to bury the dead with the same politeness he demanded of his soldiers. The war, he said, would soon be over for you. You must wait for that to happen and not interfere in anything. I never imagined, said Vesredau, that in war I would have to shoot unarmed men who went into battle in obedience to false propaganda. Here his voice took on a steely hue. He declared that further rioting would not be tolerated. I intend, said Vesredau, to return to camp in full force. If any of my soldiers are killed, you will all be responsible. Vesredau's speech had the effect of a bomb going off. There was complete order. The wounded were buried. There was enough gasoline in the village to return to our original positions. We returned to the road. The wounded were left at the German post. The next day they would be picked up by orderlies. Six more were killed. They will forever remain in the soil of Ukraine. We cast a last look at the faces of the peasants disappearing in the clouds of smoke raised by the trucks. Joy was replaced by a sombre mood. Only the side of a truck and the ridiculous bloody corpse of a pig covered with flies loomed ahead. We wanted the war to end and peace to come. We resembled the seriously ill in whom the coming of spring brings new hopes. But the war didn't stop. Peace was only a phantom, and there was always someone who lit the fire of war. Perhaps they had their reasons, and very good reasons. One of the guerrillas, while we were climbing up the hill, ran across the road, and, having spotted us, had ten minutes to prepare a trap. He hid the mine in a pothole, of which there were many on the road. And then he probably hid in the distance to see what would happen. He probably saw a bright yellow flash, saw the all-terrain vehicle ahead of him blown to pieces. Smoke rose in rings toward the sky, where the sun was smiling. The soldiers pulled the wounded out of the mangled rover. The rest of us prepared for defence. We laid Vesridau and five others on an earthen hill. Two were already dead. Another one had his leg blown off by shrapnel. Vesridau was all wounded, his body was broken. We did everything we could for him. The company considered him a friend. We managed to bring him back to consciousness. We've seen many deaths, but this one was unlike the others. Vesridau's face was not distorted by pain. He even managed to smile. We thought he would survive. In a weak voice, he turned to us. He urged us again to remain united, united in the face of all we would have to endure. He pointed to his pocket. Feldfiebel Spelovsky extracted from it an envelope, undoubtedly a letter to his relatives. After that, another minute passed. We watched our commander die. It was hard to tell from our faces what we were feeling, but the silence became heavy. The lives of two more people in the all-terrain vehicle were saved. We carefully loaded them onto the remaining vehicles. Lieutenant Vollers took command. He managed to decently organise the funeral of our commander. One by one, we walked by his grave and saluted. We all felt as if we'd lost the man on whom the whole company depended. It was as if we had been abandoned. That same evening we returned to the lonely village where our comrades were already waiting for us. The news of the commander's death shocked everyone. We were all threatened with death, but that Vesredau would die seemed to us as incredible as the death of a parent can seem to small children. For any other death, we were prepared, but no one could accept that our commander would suffer such a fate. The sentries were feeling particularly restless that night. Our three companies now seemed more vulnerable than ever. We waited for help and support, but our commander was silent forever. Who would be appointed as the new commander? On whom would our fate depend? With the first rays of sunshine, we managed to transmit messages to headquarters. DO 22Y17 has arrived. We were ordered to go immediately to the front line to the north. 
The base was ordered to be destroyed along with the village. We can't leave the enemy the slightest opportunity to find shelter. But we had no fuel at our disposal. We had to set fire to the thatched roofs of the houses. Then our motorised company left on foot, loading ammunition on old trucks left at our disposal. They were protected by radio operators and motorcyclists. Every 10 to 15 miles they had to stop and wait for our approach. We would either arrive at the front all at once or not at all. The orders were absolutely idiotic. The officer who issued them had no idea of the condition of the moving units, supposedly ready for any danger. We did the best we could. The worst of all was the food supply. We had not received provisions for a long time and only miraculously got them for ourselves. We hunted, ravaged nests, tried to chew plants that resembled lettuce. Sometimes they managed to catch an abandoned horse, but 500 soldiers need a lot of food, so every day we faced the same problem. We'd ask for help on the radio and we'd hear back. The train is on its way. It should reach you. The military mail also disappeared into infinity. We received no letters, no parcels, not the slightest bit of news. The sun was blazing hot. Our situation had become desperate. Last night we had eaten a pig that had been killed. The barrel of boiled water from under the meat disappeared too. We called it meat broth, though it barely smelled of meat. We set off for the front. Our eyes are like ravenous wolves. Our stomachs are empty and our pots are empty too. No hope looms on the horizon. We were used to living in a half-starved state. Our stomachs have processed food that would drive a respectable bourgeois to his grave in a few days. Now that it was Lent, our senses were sharpened to the extreme. We were like animals searching the desert for something to attack. It would take ten days of marching before the hungry gleam disappeared from our eyes. Then, though our stomachs were empty, we still hoped we would find food. Russia, after all, is not a desert. There are fertile fields all around us. Soon we will come across some village and have a good feast. Shpilovsky and Lenzen looked at the map. Our neighbourhood is full of villages, so we are not in danger of starving to death. But unfortunately, the map showed an area larger than the whole of France. There are several hundred kilometres between the two villages. To go off the road to get to the nearest village would mean another few days' march. Nothing to worry about. Lenzen didn't like to admit defeat. The steppe is full of villages not marked on the map. There are also collective farms. We have orders to march north. It must be carried out without delay. But there was nothing to eat where we passed. We had already passed many kilometres, but all we could see were uncultivated fields. You could make a lot of money out of these fields if you started growing something here, said a farmer from near Hanover. Near every village there were huge wheat fields, but beyond them there were only lawns, mud and dense forest in pristine condition, areas the size of a French département. We are used to long distances, seeing them as potential battlefields. Those who return home from the war will have a hard time because the horizon is just a stone's throw away. And we, who are used to fields stretching to the sky, will have to sit on a piece of land that belongs to someone. If it weren't for this war, we loved the endless expanse, and long after the war we remembered it with longing. If only we could find something to eat. After an eleven-hour rest, we resumed the march. Like pills, we swallowed the wheat ears we had prepared two days earlier. We still had some boiled millet, but that was for last resort. There was at least one advantage. The light meal did not make us sleepy. We sipped warm water from flasks. The streams were far away, and it seemed dangerous to drink water from the pond. You might catch malaria, typhoid or something like that, cholera of some kind. To cheer up the mood, we sang a song. The words and melody were blown across the empty spaces by the warm summer wind. But we had already gotten used to not hearing the echo, as it was when we sang in cities where there were walls everywhere. We drink and drink wine. There's so much of it here, as much as water. We didn't have much choice. There was no wine, and water had to be drunk with caution. 
Company, march. And we marched on, singing to ourselves. Gradually, dusk fell. The column stopped. The darkness hid our faces. It seemed as if we hadn't even passed anything, but we were already falling asleep. At dawn, we continued on our way. The mountains on the horizon did not come closer to us, although we had been walking for hours through the valley. The highest hills were as tall as a man. From time to time, there were islands of trees which made me think of African oases. They were small. The wind blew red dust everywhere, as if we were walking on crumbled bricks. We had long ago spit on the marching order. We did not march in threes, but, as was the custom of the partisans, divided into compact detachments, in which one went forward only until the next was in line with him. All were falling off their feet from fatigue and slowed their step. We stopped singing and chattering. There was only enough strength and breath to move one foot after another. But how much farther could we go? Our boots were covered with dust. The wind covered our uncombed hair with mud. It seemed we had not moved a kilometre. The rhythm of our steps became monotonous. Only from time to time someone's stomach rumbled with hunger. The hike was interrupted by an event that occurred after an eleven-hour break. Two airplanes appeared in the sky. We had spotted them earlier, but fortunately they were far away. The horizon was huge and the planes could be seen a mile away. Now they were both hovering right above us. By habit we spread out and prepared for defence. Once again, it was time for someone to die. What kind of planes are they? Either light bombers or reconnaissance planes. But Russian, that's for sure. Both planes flew at an altitude of 450 metres. The roar of the engines echoed in our empty stomachs. We opened fire. The planes didn't respond. They just circled above us, and we watched their manoeuvres anxiously. They were sure to fire on us a second time. But on the second run, only a swarm of white butterflies appeared in the sky. The leaflets. As soon as the planes left, we picked up the leaflets. A soldier came up to me with a dozen. The Russians were totally freaked out. We started to read the communist appeals. German soldiers. You have been betrayed. Surrender and we will spare you. You've lost the war anyway. To boost morale, the leaflets had lousy pictures. The captions said that they were ruins of German cities after a bombing raid. The names of these cities were not given. There were also pictures of smiling German prisoners of war. Under each was a text message. Comrades, our captivity has nothing to do with the lies we were made to believe. We were pleasantly surprised by the treatment of the camp officers. When we think how you, comrades, are hiding in the trenches just to save the capitalist world, we can give you only one piece of advice. Throw down your weapons and so on, in the same spirit. One soldier became furious. Oh, those bastards! I know for a fact that prisoners are shot. He tore the leaflet to shreds and threw it in the air. We resumed our journey. But the leaflets kept going around. The words war lost, betrayal, cities bombed, resounded in our minds. Communist propaganda, that's what it was. It's enough to talk to that soldier who was tearing up leaflets. But everyone who's been on vacation has seen the bombing with their own eyes, and our shameful retreat, and the miserable existence we had to endure. No fuel, no cars, no food, almost nothing. Maybe the war really is lost. No, it's impossible. Here we are, walking on a Russian field. But to whom does it belong? To us or to them? Maybe it will witness our slow death. No, what a thought. We're just having temporary difficulties right now, but they will soon pass. Tomorrow the supplies will arrive. Everything will once again serve a purpose. Let's shake our heads. Let's get the defeatist thoughts out of them. The sun is shining in the sky. Let's keep moving. We belted out one of the marching songs, deliberately shouting it at the top of our lungs. There are roses blooming in the garden. That's where Erica lives. There are thousands of roses, and Erica is among them. At the rest stop, gals brought me down from the clouds to the ground. Although we were quickly forgotten by the hunger, it was not pleasant to come out of a deep sleep. 
Hey, wake up. I can hear the guns, he said. I listened. But nothing but the sounds of the night came to my ears. Gals, leave me alone for God's sake. Don't wake me. We're going again tomorrow, and I'm dead tired. I tell you, I'm not the only one who hears the cannons. Look around you. Others are listening too. I listened to the silence again, but all I could hear was the rustling of the wind. Maybe you're right, so what's next? It's not the first time. Go back to sleep. You'll feel better. I can't sleep on an empty stomach. I feel sick. I should get something to eat. So that's why you pushed me up. Schlesser, who was on guard duty, came up to us. Hear that, boys? The guns are going off. I can't get it into his head, said Gals. I wanted to sleep terribly, but I could not let my comrades' words pass my ears. The Russians are planning a breakthrough. Just what we need, Schlesser was indignant. Then we're all dead, said Gals in a hoarse voice. Come on, we have enough strength to resist, said a soldier. Enough strength, that's what you have in mind. Gals did not hide the mockery. And who's going to fight, may I ask? Eight hundred soldiers, starving to death, and in addition, almost no weapons. You must be joking. I'm telling you, we're finished. We're not even strong enough to escape. The soldier talking to Gals was named Kellerman. He was exactly twenty years old, but he reasoned like an experienced man and easily grasped what was happening. And the reality was that there was really no way out. Anxiety was written on the soldier's face. Suddenly, a rumbling sound came from afar. A hushed. It came again. We stared at each other. Artillery, Schlesser said. The others were silent. The fatigue made me feel as if I were split in two. I felt as if I were dreaming and real. I thought I was dreaming, and in my dream I heard the rumble of artillery. My comrades continued to discuss what was happening. I listened to them, but did not understand what they were saying. Field Feeble Shpilovsky came up to us. He, too, had come to some conclusions. It's still too far away, he said. But we are approaching the front. In a day and a half, we will be on the front line. And by car in an hour and a half, said Gals. Shpilovsky looked at him. What? Can't stand it? It's a pity, but we are no longer motorised units. Yes, I do not mean that, growled Gals. I meant the Russians. They have fuel, they have tanks. If they manage to make a breakthrough, in an hour they will be here. Shpilovsky, without saying a word, left. And what was the use of arguing with him? An officer of the great Germany. It's time to go to bed, said Kellerman. We can't think of anything better. That's a good one. I couldn't help myself. We are like animals in a slaughterhouse waiting for the butchers to come. And what, we're going to die on an empty stomach, roared Gals. Overcome with fear and hunger, we fell asleep again and slept until dawn. And it came at that hour which in civilised, orderly life is called noon. We didn't get up on a whistle or a bell. We didn't have any of those things with us. It was just that everyone suddenly began to move, and those who were still asleep woke up. Any sound or movement, strangely enough, easily brought us out of deep forgetfulness. Usually the troops going to the front prefer to go out in advance at night or until it dawned. But the Wehrmacht officers were as stubborn as sheep. They raised us at a strictly fixed hour and led us in strict order to the field of glory. In the sunlight our uniforms looked grey. On the right and left went friends who had become family for two years, and I walked in, step with them. Remembering the past, I can clearly see seemingly meaningless details. Poorly tucked pants, belts hanging from the weight, helmets hanging from one strap. Even a single uniform had its own individuality. One did not look like another, even though it had been specially designed to turn a man into a soldier who completely merged with his comrades. That's how everyone else saw us. A solid grey mass. For us, the word comrade, which did not refer to anyone in particular, was an empty sound. Behind every form, there was a personality. It's not just someone's back that's as grey as the rest. That's Schlesser's back. And over there on the right is Zolmer. A little closer, that's Lenson. That's his helmet. 
His helmet, not like the others, though hundreds of thousands of them were made. There's Prince, Hals, Lindbergh, Kellerman, Frösch. I'd recognise Frösch in any crowd. Only we had the same feelings. We all felt fear, despair and a passionate desire to survive. We spotted them 500 metres away. Three or four cars stopped waiting for us. There are at least 10,000 of them here. In the Ukrainian steppes, 10,000 is nothing. And yet, it's a lot. They were scurrying along our vehicles as if they wanted revenge for being abandoned. They were looking for something to eat, some medicine. But when they saw the state we were in, they became completely despondent. These unfortunates, drawn from several regiments of infantry, were retreating after several days of fighting with a ruthless enemy. He was playing cat and mouse with them. If he wanted, he shot them. If he wanted, he pardoned them. They walked on foot in rags. And the despair written on their faces is hard to put into words. This army had survived too many disasters. Now they were not fighting for a cause. Rather, they behaved like wolves afraid to starve to death. They no longer distinguished between friends and enemies. They would gladly shoot anyone for a piece of braid. A few days later, they proved it by slaughtering the population of two villages, but many of them still dead of hunger before reaching the Romanian border. The meeting with the retreating troops shocked us, but they were equally astonished. Where do you think you are going? said the lanky lieutenant with a sneer. He was drowning in his uniform. It was too big for him. He was talking to our lieutenant, who had taken command after Wes Radau's death. He pointed out the route on the map, named the units, their number, coordinates. The strangers listened, staggering like dry trees swaying in the wind. Do you realise what you're talking about? What other parts? What sector? What hill? You're out of your mind. There's nothing left, do you hear me? Nothing. Just mass graves that the wind blows away. The tall, dark-haired officer had a National Socialist Party badge and a bunch of grenades hanging from his belt. Is it really true? shrieked our lieutenant. I know it's not easy for you. You're hungry. That's why you're not thinking straight. It's a miracle we survived. The man approached the lieutenant menacingly. His eyes were so hateful that he looked as if he were ready to slit his interlocutor's throat. Yes, I'm hungry he growled, hungry in a way the saints would never dream of. I am hungry and sick and dying of fear, and I'm ready to avenge all mankind. I'll get rid of you first, Lieutenant. There were cases of cannibalism at Stalingrad. Now they'll happen again. You're crazy. In the worst case, we'll eat grass and roots. Russia is behind us, and there's plenty of food here. For God's sake, come to your senses. Go on your way and we'll cover you. His companion grinned. You will cover us. We can be calm. Tell that to the people in front of you. They've been fighting for five months, lost most of their comrades. They're waiting for reinforcements, uniforms, medicine, food. God knows what else. A thousand times they've hoped. You won't be able to explain anything to them, Lieutenant, and don't try... We put the ammunition we had carried on the trucks, the remnants of the former motorised division, into our packs, so we made room to put the seriously wounded. They went on the road first, thus we became even less mobile than before as we marched across the endless Ukrainian steppe. We watched the trucks disappear in the distance, envying the wounded. They might be saved. Then our motley troops continued their retreat, an empty, utterly meaningless march. We walked as if on a moving track and could not move from the place. How many hours, days and nights passed like that? I don't even remember. Our units split up. Some stayed where they were and fell asleep. They couldn't be moved by any order, any threat. The rest, those who were still strong or had enough food, kept moving. There were many cases of suicide. I remember two villages that were stripped to the ground. And there were many massacres. Soldiers were ready to slit anyone's throat for a goat's milk, a couple of potatoes, or a handful of millet. Running wolves spare no one. 
but there were a few soldiers left in the wolf pack who hadn't quite lost their human form. Some died, but saved canned milk for the young and weak. Others were beaten to death by their comrades, suspecting they were withholding food. As a rule, they were found to have nothing. But there were exceptions. One Austrian had his head bashed in. At the bottom of his satchel, they found bits of vitaminized cookies. He had probably taken them from the provision sacks of the commissariat, which had ceased to exist a few weeks before. What crumbs people died for? For a chance to eat something. When everything had been eaten, even the shoots in the vegetable gardens, 12,000 eyes stared at the village from which the frightened inhabitants had fled. Living corpses could be seen everywhere, clinging to the last threads that bound them to life. They were trying to remember the past, to shed light on the future. Thus the retreating army stood until dusk. Then three or four Russian armoured cars appeared. The Russians were already quite close. They fired machine guns at the crowd of soldiers who did not even try to flee, turned around and were gone. Those who remained alive fled to the west, which unconsciously attracted them as north attracts the compass hand. The steppe swallowed them up. Only a few managed to reach the Romanian border. It was close by, but not everyone was accessible. I was one of the lucky ones. There were nine of us. Hals and I, who were inseparable buddies, Spalowski, Frösch, Prince, and another guy named Zimenleis, who had been a clerk before the war. There turned out to be three other Hungarians with us, but we couldn't talk to them. Either they were volunteers, or they had enlisted under similar circumstances to mine. They looked at us with hatred, as if we were to blame for the failures of the Third Reich. But they kept close to us because we were their last hope of returning to their homeland. Eventually a village appeared beyond the wide field. Even now, as if in a half-drunken dream, I can still see this area. At the top of the hill we could see the huts. We decided to go in and get some leftover food. Halfway there we were stopped by the noise of airplanes. Two yaks came out for the prey. We were like animals. Everyone was fighting for survival and didn't care about the others. No one warned us of the danger. The Russian pilots spotted us and began to descend. No matter how we looked to the Russian pilots, the German soldier was still the enemy, and the enemy had to be gotten rid of. We, obeying instinct, threw ourselves into the thick grass. Bullets whistled over our heads. We, panting, jumped up and ran with all our legs, but machine-gun bursts chained us to the ground again. Airplanes came twice more, sprinkling the ground with bullets, but each time they missed. Here we miraculously found a ditch, fell into it and lay low there. We could not see the airplanes from here, but we could hear the sound of them perfectly. On the edges of the gully there were shafts of uprooted earth. The planes made one more circle over us and departed. The pilots firmly believed that they had put an end to our torment. But we survived and wandered on again in a cloud of dust. At a farmhouse left by the inhabitants about fifteen minutes before we arrived, we found a pot of artichokes and, fortified, we kept on our way. Two days later, after we had twice had to take potatoes from the Russians by force, we came upon an endless ribbon of troops retreating toward Romania and joined its ranks. Thus we visited Romania and became acquainted with its population. The Romanians were amazed at what had happened, the retreat of our army and the disintegration of the Wehrmacht. Civilian life was fraught with constant panic. Romanian partisans were active everywhere, soldiers were smashing stores for provisions, and prostitutes were appearing in the troops in such numbers that it seemed to be the entire female population of the country. In a day we did 20, 25 and even 30 kilometres, despite the fact that we could barely keep on our feet. We would take off our boots, put them on, and then take them off again. But the boils on our feet did not think to heal. My stomach rumbled with hunger. The terrain in front of us was quite romantic, but we became wolves and, except for food, did not think about anything. A tragic episode, a symbol of human madness, comes to my memory. We were in the mountains. We had just passed the town of Rigin, then called Erlau. Grey with mud, sweaty, 
we managed to avoid enlisting in newly formed units of straggling soldiers. Our column split into small units. The soldiers pushed wagons in front of them with everything they needed. We requisitioned wagons and vehicles of all purposes. Even bicycles without tyres were taken. In this mountainous terrain, enemy aviation did not bother us. But the mountains also served as a great refuge for the partisans. Between us and them, more than once fights broke out not for life, but for death. Along with others, our group was desperate to reach our homeland. All of us believed only in one thing. If we managed to survive, our homeland would receive us with tenderness and help us forget everything we had experienced. When we reached home, the war would already be over, and in the worst case, the army would be reorganised and the enemy would never enter the land of Germany itself. Yesterday we were infantrymen, soldiers in elite units, grenade launchers. We looked into the face of death a thousand times, and for what? We strove to survive for the hope of continuing to live the old way. Every day we had to continue our journey with fighting, fleeing from the Russians who chased us on our heels. There were twelve men in our detachment, among them many old acquaintances, Schlesser, Frösch, Lieutenant Wollers, Lenzen, Kellerman and Gals and I, who felt like brothers. Gals had become quite thin, who would have thought it? He often walked beside me and I felt safe, though his strength was also at an end. He was stripped to the waist with a leather belt and a bundle of machine gun cartridges hanging from his chest. From the leather ammunition pouch hung a Russian trolley coat, saved for cold weather. The heavy helmet was attached to his head, so that all the lice in his dirty hair died from lack of light. Many have dropped their helmets, but Gals said it is the last thing that binds him to the German army. Despite all the trials, we must remain soldiers. I kept my helmet too, but I carried it on my belt. One of the soldiers called us to a ravine. At the bottom of it lay a stained truck with the inscription BIA. Lenson was already running down the slope, but he was stopped. Watch out! It could be a trap! Lieutenant Wallers started to descend with Lenson. We moved farther away. The partisans had set a trap for us. In a few seconds our comrades would be blown to pieces. But from the bottom there was a scream. My God, there's a whole warehouse here! Without thinking, we rushed to the manor of heaven. Look at this! Chocolate, cigarettes, sausage! Good God! And three bottles! Shut up! Schlesser shouted. You want everyone to run away. It's a miracle no one discovered it before. How many delicacies are here? said Frosch fondly. We'll take as much as we can carry and share it on the way. We got on the road, loaded to the limit. There are thousands of soldiers walking around. We must carry everything. We were almost finished with this task when our sentries shouted, Attention! We disappeared into the bushes. We heard the rumble of a motorcycle. The motor had stopped. We rushed through the trees with our packs. We had already learned how to escape without anyone noticing us. We heard the officers shouting. Two of our comrades had been caught by either a military patrol or gendarmes. Caught with bottles under their arms, grumbled Vollers. Let's get out of here, said Lindbergh, who had run up. Someone's coming, Lenzen whispered. A military gendarme. I see a badge. Shit, let's get out of here. We scattered as if we were being chased by the Russians. After half a kilometre we stopped, hidden in the mountains. Because of these bastards I'm completely knocked off my feet, said Gals, panting. If they keep chasing us I'll hold them off. You're crazy, said Lindbergh. What are you? Shut up, replied Gals. You're not going home anyway. The Ivans will shoot you before you know it. You'd better think about what will happen to Frosch and the other one. They've been caught. It's time for refreshment, said Wallers. I'm sick and tired of just giving orders, sweating and doing in my pants like a child out of fear. If we're going to be strung up for this anyway, at least we'll have something to eat. Looking like starving animals, we gulped down the contents of the cauldrons and the rest of the food. We'd better finish it all, said Lenson. In case we get caught, then we'd be in trouble. That's right. We'll eat it all. They won't know what's inside us. We ate until our stomachs hurt.
As darkness fell, we returned to the road. Lenzen was the first to emerge from the bushes. Go on, it's clear. We walked about three or four hundred metres. We passed the ravine again, which had brought down on us the manor of heaven. No one was in sight. We walked another three or four kilometres and then stretched out on the roadside. I can't walk any more, Schlesser said. We're too hungry. Let's sleep right here, someone suggested. We can digest what we've eaten. At 2 a.m. we were awakened. Get up, shouted the old field sergeant. On the road, or the Russians will come to Berlin before you. We resumed the march. The detachment managed to get somewhere a few horse-drawn wagons, so our legs could rest. By dawn, we reached a town perched on the side of a mountain. Some splashed in the icy water, others slept stretched out on the ground. The soldiers were heading west to their homeland. They were hoping for a warm welcome and had no idea what state Germany was in. On our onward journey, we came across a majestic tree with its branches pointing straight up into the sky. And hanging from the branches were two cools on ropes. We came closer and saw two bleeding corpses. It was Frösch and his buddy. Do not worry, Frösch, whispered Gals. We've eaten everything. Lindbergh covered his face with his palms and sobbed. I barely managed to read the note pinned to Frösch's neck. I am a thief and a traitor. A little farther away, ten gendarmes stood by a motorcycle and a Volkswagen. We walked past, meeting their gazes, our pleas were heard. For fifty kilometres we passed without incident. We were unpleasantly surprised to find no reserve positions. There were only reconnaissance posts. The Russians could continue the offensive without firing a single shot. We told the scouts to leave with us. They tried to argue since there had been no fighting yet. On the second day of the third retreat, the most mobile part of the battalion halted. It was to serve as cover on the way of the rest of the units to the west. Two thousand soldiers, myself among them, stopped at a village not marked on the headquarters maps. By the time we arrived, the inhabitants had retreated deep into the forests. We had armoured personnel carriers and four small tanks at our disposal. They had served well in Poland, but compared to the T-34, they seemed like toys. Their firepower was represented by a double-barreled machine gun and a grenade launcher. Tanks we used instead of tractors dragged on them, twelve skids with weapons and provisions. Anti-tank machine guns were mounted on half-tracked vehicles. They also helped us pull the trucks out of snowdrifts. Snow got into the spokes of the huge Zundap motorcycles and they could not continue moving. Rounding out our column were three anti-tank guns. With such weapons we could fight off the partisans. And the machine gun, anti-aircraft guns and grenades had to be used to delay the Russian divisions, which included several armoured units, at least for a day. If we had won the battle we would still have had to retreat further, the length of the front in our sector was no more than a hundred kilometres, and all along its perimeter regiments like ours, and the main forces of the army were retreating westward in a forced march. The Russians, who made a breakthrough to the south, neglected our sector. There was no point in losing soldiers in pursuit of an enemy who was retreating anyway. The Russian army left us to the partisans. Their numbers were constantly increasing, it was hard to imagine where so many of them would come from in a country that seemed to be under our control. On Stalin's orders, the partisans, attacking us unexpectedly, made it difficult to retreat. They used delayed action shells, mined the corpses of our soldiers, attacked trains with provisions, isolated units and assembly points, ruthlessly treated prisoners. But they avoided battles with combat-ready units, Partisans well deserved the name given to them by the Germans, terrorists. Through their actions they achieved what was beyond the power of the regular army. The Wehrmacht was gradually bowing to the power of the enemy who outnumbered it many times over. Partisan resistance worsened the situation at the front, and the rear no longer responded to our appeals. Ukraine was sympathetic to us, but even here partisan detachments formed by order of Moscow became active. The population of Ukraine had to choose whom to support. 
the partisans killed young Ukrainians who had recently been sympathetic to Us or enrolled them in their detachments. An invisible war without leniency or pity was taking over. Subversive wars have no face. Like revolutions, there are innocent victims, hostages and ill-conceived actions. People start killing in retaliation for what happened or could have happened. This only added fuel to the huge bonfire. In the name of Marxist freedom, Ukrainians had to change their attitude towards us. They became Germany's worst enemies. The war took on a total character and the scorched earth method began to be applied. We no longer spared towns and villages because we ourselves became persecuted. And no one spared us. It was at the top of this already unbearable war that our regiment performed its terrible service. A silence hung over the snowdrifts. Only occasionally it was broken by the howl of a tiger wolf. Ten men were constantly on guard. They looked out into the distance from the hut, which least resembled a fortified fortress, or from the towers of tanks covered with snow and ice. Sometimes they ventured out into the woods for reconnaissance, though they were afraid to go far. The partisans destroyed the stoves in the huts. They thought that this way we would die of cold. Some of the huts had no roof, either burned or removed. Perhaps the partisans just didn't have time to completely destroy the villages before we arrived. But there were still too few huts for us. We had to wander around looking for a roof over our heads. We burned everything we could get our hands on, but there was a danger that the hut itself would catch fire. No one wanted to waste any more energy gathering brushwood in the woods. The soldiers, cursing the smoke that could only escape through the open doors, huddled together and tried to sleep standing up, though they were shaken by coughing. But this was so only in those huts that had a roof. Where there was no roof, there was no trouble with the smoke, but it was quite impossible to keep warm. Those who were close to the hearth were in danger of being burned alive and had to move away, while others, who were only five metres away, felt only warm air. The temperature did not rise above minus twenty. Every two hours a new detachment went to the trenches, and the sentries, white with frost, came back. The winter had gone wild. Besides, we suffered from mud. The intention to urinate had to be announced to all present. Then the others would hold their frozen hands under the urine. It often healed cuts. Early in the morning, before the polar night was over, I started guard duty. The sky was as black as over Tempelhof on the day of the bombing. By the end of the shift, it had turned an unusual pink colour. By three o'clock, the shift came in. My eyes were stinging and my nose was freezing. I had to cover it with something. Like Chicago gangsters, we put masks on our faces, pulled up our collars and tied our heads with scarves. After an hour, the pink glow changed to purple and then grey. The snow also turned grey and then darkened, and so on, until the next morning. As darkness fell, the thermometer dropped sharply, often to 30 or 40 degrees. All our equipment was in disrepair gasoline frozy. Machini oil first turned into a pasty, and then into a sticky mass. Strange sounds came from the forest. It was the trees cracking under the weight of the snow. And when the temperature dropped to minus 50, the stone began to crack. These were terrible times. Winter during the war. We'd already forgotten what it meant. Now it came upon us like a giant press, ready to crush everything underneath. We were burning everything that could burn. The lieutenant had to defend our sleds against 40 infantrymen. The sleds will go in the furnace, they were yelling. Get back, yelled back the lieutenant. The forest is full of trees. The infantrymen looked at him with incomprehensible eyes. What use were the sledges if they would all freeze to death? A detachment went into the forest to get firewood. They returned as if they were ghosts with armfuls and threw them into the fires, which began to die out. We could not let the fire go out. We prayed to God that the Russians would not go on the attack because we had taken no measures for defence. The worst thing was, of course, the guard. If you stand still you risk freezing to death. At nine o'clock it was my turn again. We, fifteen soldiers, stood guard in the ruins of the hut. For the first half an hour we clapped each other on the shoulders to disperse the blood, and the second half hour became a real torture. 
two of us fainted. We pulled our stiffened hands out of the sleeves of our overcoats and tried ineptly to bring them to consciousness. The mittens, made of leather and wool, were covered with holes and were no longer good for anything. The pain from their hands spread throughout their bodies. Four soldiers carried the unconscious men closer to the fire, which glowed in the darkness. If the Russians showed up, they could have taken us with their bare hands. Some of us just went crazy, running around crying like children. In spite of orders, I abandoned my post and ran to the nearest hut. I squeezed through the dense crowd of soldiers, stopped at the very fire, and grimacing with pain, fell to my knees, then pulled my boots right into the embers. Those crackled immediately. The pain of the contrast between the heat and the cold made me scream. But I was not the only one, the others groaned even louder. Finally, the order to move on was received. The frozen weapons seemed as fragile as glass. No one covered himself with glory fighting against the Russians. We fought a different battle. A battle against frost, fatigue, mud and lice. That fight became part of everyday life. The frost took three lives. Three times the units of the last guard returned with unmoving bodies. Inflammation of the lungs, general frostbite, physical weakness did not allow to resist the frost. Three were brought to warmth too late. Five were brought back to life by injecting alcohol into them. We covered the stiffened corpses with snow, sticking a stick with a helmet into the grave. There was no time to worry. Those who, to their own surprise, were still among the survivors, tried to start the frozen engines with stiff fingers. The situation was desperate. The engines would not start. Field feeble Shpilovsky pressed hard on the pedal's Zundapa, but that despite the fact that he piled on it 80 kilograms of weight, did not yield, and then the pedal with a crunch broke. Even the metal did not resist the cold. We built a fire under the tanks to heat them up before trying to start them. For the exhausted infantrymen, fiddling with the vehicles was torture. Vesredau, too, had lost patience. He tied his boots with some sod he had found during the retreat. We should have kept the engine idling all night, he exclaimed. It's so easy. Carelessness will ruin us. We listened to him, but nothing was reflected on our faces. For many, death was a release from their torment. Half an hour later, we heard the sneezing of a mogor. Someone managed to start the half-tracked vehicle. The driver let the engine warm up and then began to warm up the gearbox. After two hours of torment, our convoy set off, having been ordered to keep a minimum speed. Until the cars warmed up, we had to follow them on foot. At noon, several cars stopped. We had to stop too. The radiators were damaged because they were filled with pure alcohol. We had to fix them with spare parts if we could find them. Most of the time we patched holes with whatever we could find. While some of us worked, others opened canned goods. Meat could be chopped with an axe, mashed potatoes resembled cement, wine turned to bricks. The forced stop cost us an extra hour. According to the instructions received by radio, we had another hour at our disposal to connect with the main units of our troops. We passed through the territory of two defensive posts, two round trenches and three or four huts grown into the ground. We did not meet anyone. Everything seemed abandoned. The soldiers were probably asleep, warmed by the fire. We sent a small party to reconnoiter. Five minutes later, one of the soldiers, out of breath, came back to the column. Mr. Captain, trouble. There's no one alive. It's terrible. All dead. Looking more closely, we saw that the doors of the huts were broken, and at one of them lay four or five corpses. Partisans, someone shouted. They have just massacred them all. There's been fighting here recently, Mr. Captain. The bandits probably haven't dropped their weapons yet. Another platoon heeded for the second Dugut. There was a long explosion. A geyser of earth and logs exploded over the fortification. Vesre Dao cursed loudly and ran toward the trench from which smoke was billowing. We rushed after him. Three soldiers were blown to pieces. Two of them were unrecognisable. The third was still breathing. Blood was streaming from his body. 
Along with them lay the corpses of four German soldiers who had been killed before we arrived. Look out for mines, shouted Vesredau. His words were passed from one to another. The soldiers stopped at the second dugout but did not dare to enter. Six mutilated corpses, almost completely undressed, lay in a sea of caked blood. Some had been abused so badly that it was impossible to watch. Soldiers who had been through the Battle of Moscow, Kursk, Bryansk and Belgorod, who had seen different things, covered their faces with their hands and walked out. We had never seen such horror. Taking all precautions, we dragged the corpses away. Two of them had mines planted on them. We covered them with logs. There was no time and energy to dig graves. All of us considered the actions of the partisans completely senseless. Vesredau held a ceremony of farewell to the eighteen killed. We took off our caps and helmets and stood in the snow with bare heads. I had a comrade. The funeral song echoed among the Russian frost with a thousand voices. There were no flags, no music, only one terrible torpor. The spirit of vengeance behind the actions of the partisans had destroyed the last mutual understanding between the soldiers of the two armies that still remained between us. Treacherous actions we could not understand. The column took to the road again. Passing the central dugout, we saw a banner sticking out of the ground, on which revenge was written in charcoal. We drove for at least another hour. The snow muffled the sound of our engines, but we could hear distant sounds well. Suddenly, the crackling of a machine gun reached us. Vesraidau and two other officers who were with him ordered us to stop. We clearly heard the sound of firing. About ten kilometres to the west, a battle was unfolding. We were ordered to speed up the pace of movement. The tankers decided to break forward, but the officers did not allow them to leave the column. We must stay together. I sat in the third sled, which was pulled by a tank. Behind us was a motorcycle with a broken transmission. The rumble of the cannons intensified. Suddenly Vesraidau stopped the column and went out into the terrain to check the map. The tanks were unhitched from the sleds and they moved toward the battlefield. We headed after them as fast as we could. In front on a motorcycle, BMW rode Vesredo. Behind was overcome by Snowdrift's rover with 80mm anti-aircraft gun. Gasping for breath, we ran on the trail of tractors. They had far outpaced us, and those riding on them had engaged the enemy ten minutes before we arrived. We heard machine gun bursts that seemed louder than usual in the frosty air. A motorcycle pulled up beside us. Spread out through the woods, the captain ordered. We helped the motorcycle out of the snowdrift in which it was stuck, and then ran past the trees. The untravelled snow crackled under our feet. The tanks were no longer visible. After twenty minutes we occupied the nearest trench. The order was to guard the road usually along it past a lot of troops. At this post, as might be expected, had earlier been attacked by partisans, perhaps the same detachment that massacred those soldiers. But fortunately, in this case, the defenders were able to react in time. Of the twenty-two soldiers holding the post, six were wounded and two were killed. Twenty dead guerrillas lay on the snow. The wounded partisans tried to escape in the forests, but all of them were apprehended and shot. Only two were taken prisoner. They swivelled their eyes like hunted wolves and answered questions with the same thing. We are not communists. What do they take us for? Or they really don't know anything. But that's possible. They looked like animals being led to the slaughter. It was impossible to talk to them. Our soldiers prepared for revenge. Vesredau looked from the partisans to us. He questioned them once more, but it was no use. Finally, his patience broke. He waved his hand indifferently. Ours grabbed the prisoners and drove them ahead of us. The guerrillas from the sight of weapons lost their heeds and rushed to escape before they were brought to the ground by Gunfire. The post was saved by a miracle. According to the story of the soldiers who were there, they were attacked by at least two hundred partisans. For two hours the battle lasted. Now the defenders of the post were ordered to evacuate. The day was not a good one, and at the end of it, ten minutes after our departure, 
another incident occurred. A motorcycle, which was at the heat of the column, at a distance of 30 or 40 metres in front of the tank, returned to the road, struggling to get through the snowdrifts. He was followed by the tank. Suddenly there was an explosion. Icicles fell from the branches with a glassy sound. The tank was blown off the road. The explosion tore the car apart. Flashes of flame appeared. Those on the sled reacted immediately. One of the officers jumped on the hull of the tank to save the tankers who were badly wounded. The others ran to him, and the infantry stood on both sides of the road, preparing to repel the surprise attack. The tank was enveloped in black smoke. We were powerless to help the crew. We poured fire extinguishers on the tanks, but the fire inside flared up more and more. We hastily dragged the sled from the tank's gas tank, poured out a huge amount of burning fuel spilled on the snow. With impotent rage, officers and soldiers watched three soldiers burned alive. The smell of burnt meat mingled with the smell of gasoline and oil. The two sitting in the motorcycle drove over the same spot in seconds. Apparently, their tires only miraculously did not hit the detonator. They too looked at the tank, and cold sweat trickled down their backs. The column threw the burning tank, from which the shells began to explode. The heavy skids and some equipment burned. Those riding on them had to find places in the trucks. The column made a detour in order not to get under machine gun fire, and two tankers died without even getting a chance to defend themselves. For three years they were on the fronts and deserved eternal memory. We left this land to the Soviets, who pursued us on our heels. Thus ended the last European crusade. Even in the face of danger, we continued to think about the unbearable cold. Soon there was a connection of our unit with the main forces of the division. It happened in the city of Bobruisk, which had an important strategic importance. The sappers manned the area between the Wii and the trenches. Other infantry regiments reached Bobruisk, as well as an armoured platoon of tigers. The presence of the tigers gave everyone hope. They resembled fortresses of steel. No Soviet tank could compete with them. In Bobruisk, several civilian employees of the Wehrmacht were also drafted. Quite unexpectedly, they found themselves in the centre of the battle. Before, for them, Russia looked like a settled city, where you could shelter from the cold and have enough to eat, if, of course, you kept in touch with the provisioning units, and to spend the evenings with charming Ukrainian women, of whom there were many. They were already preparing to leave in a hurry for a quieter place with their superiors. We had the honour of protecting the bureaucrats' love nests, but we tempered our fury, for we were too tired and hungry, and quickly climbed into the warm huts. Here food and drink were waiting for us, and we had an opportunity to wash ourselves. There were no lamps or candles in the huts, but these paradisiacal corners were perfectly illuminated by the light of the stove, into which we threw whatever we could find. A few hours after our arrival, we melted several tons of snow and, having undressed, began to scrape off the mud. We washed pants, underwear, shirts. We don't know when we'll have this opportunity again. It must not be missed. Someone managed to find a box of toilet soap. We threw it into the biggest troughs, one by one timed on a stopwatch, splashing around in the foamy water. Two minutes each, not a second more. The water splashed out of the trough onto the floor of the hut, where thirty grimy soldiers were gathered. More and more water was poured into the troughs. In the darkness we did not notice how the foam, which had given us so much pleasure, had turned grey. When we had finished washing, we threw the water from the trough into a hole in the hut. It was out of the question to go out, the thermometer showed minus fifteen, and everyone was undressed. After pouring out the water, we broke the troughs and used them for fuel. Gals began chewing a bar of soap. Laughing, he explained that he was scraping the dirt off the insides, which were just as dirty and had just as many lice in them. Let a regiment of Russians come now. I feel renewed, he said. Suddenly the door slid open. The hut immediately felt cold. We cursed at the newcomers, but the hands of the soldiers on the doorstep were bursting with delicacies. The food of the gods. The soldiers pillied their luggage on a mountain of wet overcoats. A bundle of peppered sausage 
loaves of rye breed, cans of Norwegian sardines, dried ham, eight or ten bottles of schnapps, brandy, Rhine wine, cigars. The soldiers continued to empty their overcoat pockets. Our amazed screams shook the walls. Where did you get this from? Someone asked. Those damn bureaucrats stashed it away. Our cook never dreamed of such things. They were ready to run off with it when we got here. They were so pissed off. Said they'd report us for stealing their property. Who are they trying to fool? I'll tell them where to shove their report. Everyone started eating the delicacies. Gals's eyes popped out of his pupils. Don't eat my share, he said, pulling on his wet clothes. I must see it for myself. I'll get some more. Do they think we're going to put our chests to bullets and they're going to eat their fill? No way. Gals wrapped himself in a turtleneck and went out into the cold. With him went Zolma, a young soldier, half Hungarian, half German. He came into the army under about the same circumstances as I did. At this time, Pastor Fergam, assisted by Oberefleutnant Lenzen and Goth, number two, divided the food. We had to chop the bacon with picks the bayonets proved too blunt. Fergam had left his religion on the east bank of the Dnieper and was now swearing like a heathen. Just think of it, how much guts we've let out with this thing, and here it can't handle lousy bacon. Borrow some dynamite from the bomb squad, but hurry up. We all got the same. The Wehrmacht camaraderie is not dead. Under normal circumstances, we would have been wary of trusting each other, but now everyone felt responsible for everyone else. The bureaucracy that reigned in the calm atmosphere of Bobruisk surprised rather than angered us. We considered it fair to steal delicacies from them. We were still striving for order, which was so much talked about in the teachings of National Socialism, and we did not consider those who stashed food while soldiers were dying in battle to be human beings. Fergam ranted on this subject without stopping to chew. Soldiers live here, for we are constantly being hunted and to speculate too long is a waste of time. If there is something to drink and eat, why not seize the opportunity? Why not love, not serenade a girl's hair or her eyes? Time has no patience. Any minute may be the last. We put portions of Galsa and Zolma into their helmets. As we emptied the bottles, we belted out songs. Our greedy friends never returned. They were caught snatching a bottle of brandy out of an official's hands and given six days of punishment. Later, Gals could not recall his prank without scolding. A quiet night, silent night, Christmas night. The wind is blowing through the labyrinths of the trenches north of Bobruisk. The companies are occupying the positions prepared by the troops who left westward to the border with Bessarabia two days ago. The collapse of the Southern Front forced us to retreat and regroup. The Soviets were closing in on us relentlessly. More and more reinforcements were arriving in the sector. We had a premonition that the battle would be fierce. There was hilly and wooded terrain all around. Tanks and mobile artillery were frozen in the bush. We emptied all the supply depots. The commander arranged a three-day binge as compensation for the coming carnage. It was Christmas 1943. Despite the miserable situation, we, as if we were children who had long been deprived of joy, were seized by nostalgic feelings. Under the steel helmets stirred up old memories. Some spoke of peace, others of childhoods that were still in the not-too-distant past. They tried to speak in a firm voice, but their voices treacherously shook. Vesre Dao went around the trenches, talked to the soldiers, and himself could not detach himself from the memories. He undoubtedly had children with whom he wished to spend time. Sometimes he would fall silent, looking up into the dark sky. Icicles froze on his long overcoat like Christmas tree ornaments. During those four days, our only problem was the cold. The platoons on the line were constantly rotating, and the nights, which were especially hard, were split in two. But every day more and more soldiers with pneumonia went to the hospital and I was twice brought into the hoot and brought to consciousness. Painful cracks appeared on my face, especially at the corners of my lips. Fortunately, there was enough food. The cooks were instructed to include as much fat as possible. Provisions arrived regularly, 
and our cook, Gransk, prepared fatty soups full of oil. Despite the inconvenience, these measures bore fruit. The cooks learned the secrets of cooking from the Russians. In addition, we bathed in a bathhouse, going from hot steam to cold showers. Our hearts almost stopped beating, but this contrast was beneficial. Make the most of it, said Grensk. Eat to your heart's content and be happy. Even children starve in Germany. Unfortunately, Gransk was not wrong. As Paula wrote in a letter that reached me in only six days, rations in Germany were severely restricted. Each day we got closer and closer to the border. The distance from home became shorter. One morning, at the signal of the field officer, we jumped out of the heated hut, barely having time to rub our eyes. At a distance of two kilometres from Bobruisk, we found a connection of Soviet tanks. We were hit as if by a butcher's axe. Everyone took his position. In the west, the air shook with explosions. Russian tanks, resembling furious bulls, entered the minefield. Now it was their turn to take to the air. Observers looked through binoculars. Tanks tried to leave the same way they appeared. Our artillery was silent, leaving the matter to the mines. But three tanks managed to pass through the minefield and headed towards the city. They steadfastly withstood the fire of our anti-tank guns, not even slowing down. But when they were hit by 88 mm guns of camouflaged Tigers, all three tanks were hit. The first flipped over, the second froze in place, and the third turned, opening its side to our anti-tank guns, which blew away all of its guns. However, it still managed to turn around. We froze, watching this fight. Now he was going straight into the minefield. The tank's tracks were torn off by the explosion, and black smoke burst out of its bowels. Two tankers jumped out. We didn't shoot. The two Russians clutched their pistols in their hands, ready to fight to the last man. But not hearing the shots, they went to our lines, lowered their weapons and raised their hands. In a second, they crossed the front line. The infantryman who called them heroes grinned, and the Russians smiled back. Their white teeth resembled the teeth of a negro, so blackened by the smoke their faces were. Ours led them into the hut and gave them schnapps. Their behaviour was so different from the partisans that we had not the slightest hatred for them. Lenzen observed them and said, If Wiener had been here, he would have raised a toast to them. The next day, we sent the sappers out to re-mine the field. We had to rely on mines. We didn't have enough manpower. The next day, reinforcements came. Two Romanian regiments and a Hungarian battalion were sent to us. A squadron of airplanes based near Vinitsa was to provide support. It's going to be a big show, Fergam said. I don't like it. Oberif Leutnant Lenson held the opposite view, that the reinforcements pleased him. He believed that the Reds had to be stopped here. It never occurred to him that Prussia was about to fall into enemy hands, but none of us at the time could even imagine such a thing. One night, the Russians sent Asians against our positions. They were supposed to defuse a minefield. The Russians relied heavily on tanks, and since they did not spare men, they often sent their own soldiers to perform such tasks. This action of the Russians, of course, failed. The minefield exploded under the screaming crowd, and those who survived we shot. The corpses quickly stiffened in this cold, so the stench didn't spread far. The Russians didn't even try to use artillery to help the Asians, so we had assessed the situation correctly. But now it was no longer possible to place mines, as the Russians fired at any moving target. We managed to bury only a few mines, but unfortunately, our losses in doing so were also great, and we did not have much hope for mines. And the next evening, when the frost became incredibly hard, the Russians again went on the attack. We stood at the positions. The temperature dropped to minus 40. From the cold, many fell before they could even cry out. It was simply impossible to survive in such an environment, but the attacking Russians suffered no less. The frost prevented them from even opening their mouths to shout, Hurrah! Both sides were ready to leave the battlefield. Metal was breaking with remarkable ease. 
The Soviet tanks were advancing along the front, but 30 meters from the front line, they ran into mines. They were also destroyed by the Tigers, who opened fire from permanent positions. The frozen Russians withdrew in disorder under continuous fire. Their officers, who thought that because of the frost we would not be able to defend, for the sake of the attack, were ready to make any sacrifice. I managed to save my hands from the frost. I stuck them directly in mittens in empty ammunition boxes. Those who had to work with their hands, such as artillerymen, sooner or later went to the doctor with severe frostbite. Many had their limbs amputated. This frost lasted for three weeks. The Russians confined themselves to music and speeches urging surrender. By the end of January, the cold had abated a little, and it was already bearable. At times the thermometer rose only to minus 15. But at night there was still a murderous frost, but by making frequent shifts we managed to endure it. We knew that soon the Russians would resume the offensive. One night, or rather morning, at four or five o'clock, the whistles called us back to our positions. An armada of T-34 tanks was approaching us with a roar. Their offensive had been preceded by an artillery preparation, which caused considerable damage to Bobruisk and caused mass evacuation of the civilian population. We managed to start the engines of our tanks, 15 Tigers, 10 Panthers and a Dusen, Mark II and Mark III. We spent the whole day the day before warming up the engines. At the beginning of the offensive, two tanks Mark II were destroyed by Russian artillery. Again, there was a danger of a breakthrough. We lay down in the trenches and waited for the Red Infantry to advance. Machine guns and anti-tank guns were still silent. The engines of the camouflaged Tigers were idling. When in the field of fire hit a Russian tank, the Tiger set it on fire. The Russians moved slowly toward us, confident and fired at random. Maybe they would have succeeded in demoralising us if we had seen the battlefield but it was hidden in the smoke. The first wave of Soviet armoured forces was smothered 500 metres from our positions. They could not withstand the fire of Tigers, Panthers and anti-tank guns. Tiger was a real fortress. The enemy's fire did not harm it in the slightest. The thickness of its front armour reached 15 centimetres. The only disadvantage of this tank was low mobility. After the first wave went the second, more dense, now the infantry was coming at us. We waited with parched mouths, with rifle butts to the shoulder and grenades. Our hearts were beating hard. Suddenly a miracle happened. Thirty of our airplanes appeared in the sky. As promised, the Vinitsa squadron went to the attack. It was not difficult for them to pin the attackers to the ground. Not a single bomb was wasted. From the trenches came the cry, Long live victory! Long live the Luftwaffe! We shouted as loudly as if the pilots could hear us. We opened fire from all guns, but the Russians, despite the huge losses, did not retreat. German tanks also went to the enemy. The air was filled with the rumble of tracks and acrid smoke, the smell of gunpowder and burning gasoline. Our shouts merged with those of the Russians who trembled in the face of unexpected resistance. We saw how majestically moved our tigers as they shelled the enemy tanks a new attack of Luftwaffe planes. This time they used rockets and 20 mm guns. Russian artillery did not stop shelling our positions. Several men were killed, but we did not pay much attention to it, especially since the guns soon fell silent. The defeat of the Russians was completed by a second squadron of German airplanes, a luxury we could not have dreamed of. We threw ourselves into each other's arms. We were overflowing with joy. We'd been in retreat for a whole year in the face of superior enemy forces. Lenzen shouted as if the devil had possessed him. I told you we'd make it. I told you we'd pull through. Our exploits were reported in the command's bulletins. The front on the Romanian border had been held. After months of continuous attacks, despite the cold, German-Romanian troops repelled the Russian offensive and destroyed tons of enemy weapons. A clear proof of our achievements was the mass of mangled metal and corpses lying before our eyes. G. 
During the month, the Red Army attacked along the entire 400-kilometer front line 16 times. Given that there had been virtually no fighting for three weeks, all of these attacks came in one week. On five occasions, the Russians were defeated, and in only one area did they nearly succeed. In the south, they managed to make a breakthrough, but they were surrounded and either outnumbered or captured. In our sector, however, no one retreated a single step. We were filled with pride. We proved again that with good weapons and thorough training, we could hold off superior forces of an enemy who never thought out his combat operations properly. Often in difficult moments, Vina reminded us of the failures of the Russians. At the sight of a burning enemy tank on his face appeared a smirk. What a fool, he said. So stupidly caught. Only quantity they will be able to defeat us. The soldiers of Great Germany were awarded 30 iron crosses. The same number was given to the tankers who deserved it.